Good morning. Welcome to uh, What's Up with the Market, 20th of June, 2024. We're going to go through market status today, as we normally do every couple of weeks. Some reminders. None of the analysis I do here today is used in SPAR3 Investor or SPAR3 Trader. And I don't use any of this analysis to make any buy sell decisions or any money management decisions to in this in the ASX and US public portfolios, the real money portfolios that I manage with my own money. And I also don't use any of this analysis in my own personal portfolios, obviously not public portfolios. I just am a 100% mechanical trader and I precisely follow our systems and have done for many years or even decades now. But just before I get into the session, we had a, a question asked uh, by, by Bruce uh, and from the last session we did on the 7th of June. And uh, he just wrote in to say, what did I mean by being fully invested in this market, which is a statement that I made last uh, in the last session. And uh, from a mechanical investing perspective, we this kind of mechanical trading is we are fully invested when the, there have been sufficient signals to, uh, to fill our portfolios. Now in the US at the moment, that is that is the case we've got i also run a leveraged public portfolio as well and that is fully invested with 15 positions the us portfolio is 10 and that's fully invested however the asx is not fully invested and as bruce said he said uh, three investor asx stocks has triggered several sales but few buys recently and that his portfolio is a four out of ten and the public portfolio at the time was four out of nine but has since had a sell in Santos as well. So it's down to three out of nine, but around about 33% invested. So is that fully invested? The answer is yes, it's fully invested by, by, by what's allowed as Bruce says. So are we fully invested as the signals allow? And the answer to that is yes, that is what fully invested is. So in a, in a, in a raging bear market where you've had sell signals and you're 100% in cash and, and you have any open positions and you have vacant nine or 10 vacant positions, you are fully invested, but you're fully invested in cash at the time. And that, that's following the rules of the system. And that, that's what the system designed to do in raging bear markets to have only provided sell signals, no re-entries, and that you sit most of a bear market out, not typically 100% because there might be a false signal or two on the way down because eventually the market bottoms. And when that does, as I covered in the webinar yesterday, is the best return years you know, were 2009, straight after the you know, a 50% fall. 2001, two and uh, sorry, 2003, when we reached the bottom of that of that of the tech bear market, those are the best markets. But that's when people don't invest because they don't trust and they don't follow the entry signals when that happens. So we got to. That's when we. That's when we actually got to follow our signals the most, and that's when we tested the most to trust the system. So that is that's what's meant by fully invested. Hopefully, I've covered that off. Before we get into the actual price data, bearing in mind that uh, that today is a is a public holiday in the US, so the latest data is up to the 18th of June, not the 19th of June. Everything we cover is of general investment advice and nature, and there's no personal or specific advice that that we are licensed to provide. But we are provided. But we do have a license to provide. We do have a license, sorry, to to provide information and advice on uh, on a general investment advice basis. Right, getting into the charts. The Dow Jones, the the Dow Jones. What's the comment here? Firstly, I'll go straight to bottom right hand corner here, underperforming the broader market, the S and P 500, and we have completed. And I'll just go into my swing chart here that we have completed a, a almost a mini double top, if you like, but did not make a new high, and looks like we are making. We have formed a low here, and that is slightly lower low than than that previous low, but not a lower low than this low. So. What is this? It's almost like an inside swing. And that inside swing is telling us that there's some indecision in the market in the Dow Jones, the 30 constituents there. And uh, we'll see a very different chart now. We've had a 23.6% retracement here, which is pretty similar. Went a little bit past 23.6, which we have here on this retracement of that upswing. Now, this Fibonacci runs from that trough there all the way to this new high high that was made up over here. So a little bit of indecision and un, in the Dow and some underperformance of the broader market, which is the S&P 500. And that is certainly going gangbusters. So it has not completed a new swing here, a new swing peak, which will happen when we have a, a three lower lows. This is a three day swing. So it's looking for a, a third, a three, a, a low to a form that's lower than the last, the previous three bars. And in an uptrend, I have redrawn this 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 channel that that we had in here i'll just go back to what i had beforehand the previous channel 
was on an arithmetic chart and it is quite a long channel. It's basically formed from the bottom. I'll just zoom back a bit. There's the COVID-19, uh, sorry, yeah, the COVID-19 crash over here, formed that channel. And I basically kept these parallel, parallel lines going. Now, what I've done is, as you can see, we're getting to the top over here and we've had a run up from 2,200 to 5,400. So that's about a 250% run up or two and a half times run up, if you like. And the so what I've done is I've gone to log and uh, let's just click on that. And you can see that there is a slight difference in how the log chart handles things. And I've now redrawn these trend lines and uh, just to get a, because this is running now from 3,500. So about a fifth or well, whatever it is, 70%, 60, 70% run up from this trough over here. And it does give you a slightly different picture. Uh, now, what is reality? Well, reality is what we're seeing. And the and technical analysis is subjective as to where you put these. And it really comes down to a trained eye. Now, this forms a little bit more of a bullish view. And so we should at this stage be, because you typically go to log when you get you know, two to three times growth in the price action from the bottom part of the chart, the, the auto, the, 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 the price over here, we get two to three times greater. And we, we've got that on going back all the way back to the trough of the COVID crash, but not in the, in this chart. So it's somewhere in between. And to take this a bit further, I should actually go and draw these same parallel lines, these channel lines going back over here, which if I did that, what I would do is I'd right click and go parallel. And then I drag that to over here. You can see it almost does form. You can see that that initially is uh, does uh, when you're going from 2200 to 4700. So more than doubling, you, you end up with what I call a spine over here. And you could then do parallel from there as well. So it's uh, that is how you would do your analysis and with delete. But this picture now is telling us that we are in the lower part of this channel at the moment with on the log chart. And I've just redrawn touch points here, parallel touch points there, touch points here on the median line. So that to me is a valid channel line and it just does paint a slightly different picture. But it just shows you how subjective technical analysis can be and why I don't use it for mechanical trading. What I will do here quickly now is I'll put on, I've already got that on. You can see there was an entry signal back here on the S&P 500 back in, on, in uh, uh, sorry, November of 2023 and is well above the trailing stop here. So this, from, from an S&P 500 perspective, you know, it's, it's game on, it's risk on. But that's not the total picture. Let's just keep looking. First of all, there's no divergence here using what, is what we're looking for. So this cumulative new high, new low line is rising, maybe flattening a bit, but certainly not dropping. It's not that volatile a line anyway, but we have the index here, which is the S&P 500 rising. However, there is divergence on the cumulative on the cumulative advanced decline line of the this is the 250 stocks that make up the New York Stock Exchange. And you can see here that there are more stocks starting to fall than rise, more starting to decline than, than advance. However, we're having the S&P 500 make new highs. So that's divergence. And that typically is showing a sign of weakness from a breadth of market perspective. So there's a sign of weakness. Another sign of weakness is the number of stocks in the S&P 500. That, that are above their 150 day simple moving average. And you can see that this is declining. So there are, there are more and more stocks that are below their 150 day moving average. However, the index is advancing. So that's divergence and that is showing some weakness. So there was divergence there and div divergence there. But as I keep saying, di you know, divergence from breadth of market indicators aren't a 100% dead cert that the market's gonna fall as we saw here. So there was divergence there, falling there, rising there, and but the market continued higher. But what you will find is in most cases when the market does fall, is that you will find divergence, but not sometimes it arises, you'll also still find divergence. So it's just an indication, not a dead cert rule. And uh, let's move on to the US dollar, the one that I put the most credence in. What we're looking for here is the market to be rising and the US dollar to be falling. And that happens quite a lot. So it's a good indication, a little bit of an early sign as, as well, but we do have you know, risk on here. So the, the US dollar is there's falling markets rising, falling, rising. And we do have just putting to smooth this out and not have to take too many subjective readings of, of trend lines and whatever's is that this is the relative strength line here between 
the the US dollar and the S and P five hundred. So that is you know, the if you want to call it the 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 dollar US dollar to stocks ratio. And you can see that when this falls over here, that's the that means that there's weakness of the US dollar to the equities to the S and P five hundred, which is a risk on measure. And probably one, if you had to weight these breadth of market and sentiment indicators that we look at here, this one should get a higher weighting than some of the others that we look at. And this, so the green line over here showing the Ciroc falling, which is a smooth representation of that relative strength line, is it's a risk on market at the moment. So it probably hangs in the balance of being risk on, but we're going to see some negative indicators of which this one is not. This is the growth compared to growth stocks, the Russell Growth Index to the value, Russell Value Index. And you can see, and it's very visible, it's not always this visible, like over here, you can kind of see the, the growth index rising, value index rising, and it gets a bit messy, but this is pretty blatant. You know, the growth is rising, and this is uh, quite a large, it's a thousand growth stocks versus a thousand value stocks, so it's a pretty wide, broad index, and that is rising versus the value falling, and that's why we have risk on. Another one to put a little bit more weight in than others, so that favors the risk on. Right, let's look at consumer discretionary versus staple and typically in a, in a bull market uh, we'll have discretionary outperforming staples and here it's you can actually also with the eye vis visibly see that the staples are, have got a bit more strength than what the discretionary have you can see the relative relative strength line falling and here the smoothed in the smoothed uh, index rate of change that i have on here the siroc is also falling so that's giving a risk off so we favors bull but not a raging bull at this stage this is one that also favors the, the, a bit of negativity in the market or, or confusion, if you like. And indecision is the put call ratio on the S&P 500, equities only. And you can see here that we are having higher lows, which means that favors puts. So there's more puts, slightly more puts being taken out than calls. The smooth line over here is also rising. The blue line over there, which is an annual 252-day simple moving average on the put call ratio. And I smooth that with the Ciroc. And that's rising because the Ciroc is, a, is more of a trending indicator than a momentum indicator. And while the S&P 500 is rising, we are getting the, the more puts put on. So there's a bit of divergence happening there as well. That's why I've got the red indicator line over here favoring the bearish side. More confusion. There's another one which you should probably wait a little bit more, but not anywhere near as much as the US dollar, is the 10-year Treasury note, the yield in the 10-year Treasury note. And you can see this is falling. It's in a downward channel. And right at the bottom of the of the, the bottom channel line is where this price is hanging around at at the moment. The yield, that is, sorry. And what that's done is uh, the relative strength of, of equities to, to, bond, to, to bond yields is that equities are winning out. And the relative strength line, smoothed over here, just recently given a risk on signal. S&P 500 rising at the bottom over here. So this favors the bullish case. I think you're getting the picture. Now, this goes to bonds. So when yields are falling, bonds are rising. And typically, the story is, is that, you know, stock prices will rise when, when yields are falling and bonds being the opposite of yields is that you'll find the bonds rising. So it's good to have bonds and equities, equity prices going in the same direction, which is what they're doing at the moment, even though this bottom line tells us over here that equities are going up more than what bonds are, which is what you typically find because equities are more volatile than bond prices. And the VIX index, the fear index is down over here behaving at lower level, at quite low levels. And so that favors risk on as well. So that favors the bullish case. Right now to the NASDAQ composite. And what we look for here is kind of a sentiment indicator is how well the NASDAQ is doing relative to the S&P 500. And that tells us this relative strength line, the ratio line is rising. I smoothed that with the Ciroc indicator, trend indicator, and you can see this is risk on. So we've now got the NASDAQ outperforming the S&P 500, which is doing pretty well anyway. And that's kind of why you know, we've got AR stocks in, in, this, in this index. And if you go to the NASDAQ 100, so a smaller NASDAQ composites, 2,200 odd stocks, the NASDAQ 100 is obviously 100. How's that doing? And what we're seeing over here is relative to the S&P 500, the, the ratio is rising. So it's also outperforming the S&P 500 and the smooth index, index rate, the, the trending indicator that I use down here, the Ciroc, is showing that it's risk on relative to the S&P 500, which is what you want. The tech stocks to be doing better than the, than the, the broader market of the S&P 500 and that's happening. However, we have a little bit of divergence here. If you're looking at new highs and new lows that are being made in the NASDAQ 100, that the they are starting to be more stocks make new lows out of the 100 in, in the index compared to those that are rising and advancing, sorry, that are making new 52-week highs. 
And here we have the index rising, so we're getting a bit of divergence there, which is a little bit of a bearish indicator from a breadth of market perspective. And you had two in the accumulative advanced decline line and the NASDAQ 100, we've got divergence as well. So we were flattening there, the, the, the gray line was flattening being the advanced decline line and the blue line being the index. We're seeing the index rising, advanced decline line falling, which means there are more of the 100 stocks that make up the NASDAQ 100 falling than rising at the moment. There's no, that's not a 52 week low, that's just a day by day basis. So there's some divergence there, which is a bearish sign. And here we have more divergence on the, uh, the, the number of stocks that are above their 150 day moving average. You can see that the, 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 the number of stocks were, were falling, that, sorry, the number of stocks below were rising, meaning that they were less above their 150 day moving average falling here while the index was rising. So that line over there should equate to from start to end should be the same as that. So we made two new peaks there and two higher peak, a higher peak and we made a lower peak here. Bit of confusion. This has gone higher and then it's gone lower again. So another indication of some confusion there as to the stocks flip-flopping above their 150-day moving average, telling you that they're pretty close to it. They're not way above. But they're pretty close to that 150-day moving average. Moving on to the semiconductor sector, which is a sector of the NASDAQ composite. And what we do here is we measure how well the semiconductor sector are doing relative to the NASDAQ 100, which is already outperforming the S&P 500. So we're looking to see how how, how this, how, you know, a, a risk on, if you like, a more speculative sector is doing relative to, you know, what's considered a more speculative index, major index, relative to the S&P 500. And we see that this sector is outperforming the NASDAQ 100. So it's rising. So it's going up by more. That's what this ratio line is telling us over here relative to the NASDAQ 100. So the, the speckier sector of the speckier index than the S&P 500 is rising. It's outdoing both, which is, you know, risk on. And you know, people might argue that there's only a handful of stocks that, that may be pushing this. And video obviously being one and now being the largest cap stock in the world is that it's only in a few stocks. Well, you know, that's been the case for about 13 years now, since ever since we had the secular bull market breakout, sorry, 11 years in, in April of 2013, we've been talking about fangs and, you know, a few stocks only doing it, et cetera, et cetera, which is true. But that is, you know, that is the cases at the market is is rising and it tends to pull that's where it starts it starts in the you know the more value stocks if you like and then as a market grows and becomes more bullish you tend then you'll see the mid and small cap stocks join the party which we'll have a look at in a moment all odds is underperforming the s p 500 which is pretty obvious to the to the eye you'd this is the relative strength lines telling us that and and gathering momentum on the doubt on the on the you know the weakness if you like relative to the s p 500 while it just goes sideways again and this is what we're seeing in our asx portfolios is there's no there's no forward momentum in the price they they are they're going sideways or falling and that's why we are slowly being taken into cash now what is that telling us It's telling us when we partially invested you know it's a mechanical system has you partially invested is that there is confusion and, and indecision in the market, which is undoubtedly the case as the uh, as the Australian average uh, average index is, is showing us, right? So we need a breakout one way or the other, up or down, to resolve this indecision. And which way is that going to go? I don't know. Nobody knows. But this this weakness, you know, adding to the world weakness, if you like, which you'll look at some of the other indices in a moment, is, is just showing that this is not a raging bull market. And it's it's a tough market to trade. There's no doubt about it. You know, you can't not be in it because if the breakout happens, you you it'll be too late effectively. And then you get into indecision mode. You're no man's no man's territory, and you are no man's land. And you're deciding, well, should I join this? Is this do I trust in this breakout? You know, is is this just a false? And all that sort of indecision happens, which which is what you know, that's emotional noise based you know subject subjective trading which just you know, over the long term does not work uh, so we're waiting for the breakout to occur certainly on the australian market and the australian dollar is also going sideways but in a, in probably in a, in a larger downtrend from a bigger picture long-term perspective but has had some strength over here on the weakness of the us dollar other markets the we, we got we got a, a a symmetrical triangle forming over here I could put a trend line going up here on the on the NASDAQ, on the Nikkei index in Japan, and that is typically a continuation pattern of the previous trend going into the pattern, which is rising, and this is getting to an apex. But certainly in a in a down channel over here, which you typically find in a in a in a symmetrical triangle in a rising market, you have to have the down, the lower the lower highs to 
to form while you get the higher lows. And you can see that on the, on the, on the swing chart as well. So this, this will resolve. You're getting to an apex will resolve pretty soon. And theoretically, according to the textbooks, a symmetrical triangle should resolve in the direction of the market coming into the symmetrical triangle, which would tell you that there's a higher probability of a breakout to the upside than, than the downside, but is underperforming the S&P 500, as we can see at the bottom here. The DAX has also experienced a bit of weakness at the moment, down to 23.6% retracement after certainly a breakout to a new high, but you know, it wasn't a breakout like this is strong, but it is nonetheless a, a breakout. And we've now seen, as we go to the swing chart, you're seeing lower highs, these short little you know, when you see these long trend, these long swings form over here, that's bullish, right? Long swing up, short swings down, long swing up, short. And now we're seeing lots of little indecision type three day swings that are, that are occurring and come down right on the the, the average, the, the, the ATR trading stop that we have. This is our proprietary one and looking pretty weak against the S&P 500. And this, you know, again, also needs some resolution. So indecision mode across in in, in in Germany as well. The other one I wanted to quickly look at was the Bavispa for developing markets, underperforming, fallen out of this channel. And this really looks like a market that's going to go lower and is underperforming. So developing markets not doing that well either. Right, we'll just quickly have a look at three other indices in the US. One is the S&P 500 Equal Weighted Index, which weights the smaller cap stocks on the S&P 500 to the same weighting as the largest largest cap stock, you have NVIDIA. And you can see this is nowhere near as strong as the S&P 500 itself, meaning that the, you know, the smaller cap stocks are not playing the, their role, if you like, in pushing the index up as to what the larger cap are. And we certainly got a risk off over here. There's the cell, the, the trending indicator I have of this relative strength line. Naked eye can tell you that this ratio, this relative strength line between the S&P 500 equal weighted and the S&P 500 is that the, the equal weighted index is underperforming. So certainly an entry signal there, but has not pushed through indecision, a little bit of a symmetrical triangle forming there as well. So that is a bullish, but we are not seeing the small caps or the mid caps, which is this index, the dollar mid, the S&P 400 entry signal, exit signal a couple of days ago. This is its all time high over here, this dotted line. And you can see underperformance relative to the S&P 500. And certainly we got a the, the red dot line here, the trending indicator, the Ciroc is falling relative to the, which is the smooth representation of the relative strength line, which is risk off. So we're not having mid caps come through. They started coming through. You can see here, they started outperforming the S&P 500 a bit, but hasn't followed through. So indecision. And then if we go to the small cap, the dollar SML, the S&P 600 is also look at this indecision here and nowhere near all-time highs, so you know, we know it's not that far of all-time highs, but there's the all-time highs up there, haven't, hasn't got there, the mid got there, the equal weighted got there, all the other indices got there, but the small cap, the S&P 600, never got to its all previous all-time high. And you can see this underperformance relative to the S&P 500, and we do have now, with the, with the Ciroc giving a sell of over there, relative strength sell relative to the S&P 500, you know, a risk off. So we are not in a raging bull market, uh, you know, the, the large... The, 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 the mechanical system that SPA3 Investor you know, does favor large, large cap, more liquid stocks. There are some you know, mid cap stocks in there and maybe a couple of small cap, but very much weighted towards large cap, which is why we are fully invested over there. And even you know, with the 15 stock leverage portfolio that, that I trade, also fully invested over there and has had plenty of opportunity. So, so the, the issue here is that, is that there's indecision. There's, there's certainly some, it's, and it's a, it's a pocket market, if you like, to trade. But is it a market that you should be out of? No. Why? Because you know, we, we don't know which way this is going to resolve. And we don't want to predict or second guess or you know, try and project into the future some kind of expectation, which is really you know, one of, the, one of, the, one of the, the hallmarks of my presentation yesterday, and you should, uh, which, which was how to trade properly and how to prove the future. Is, is, is what you should have a look at to see why all of this is so important to, to be a mechanical investor. Quickly go through commodities. Not much here to point out. CRB index really going sideways. The gold, that breakout isn't, is, is, is kind of consolidating, if you like, going sideways. That is a bit of a rectangle forming over there where you've got kind of the, high, the highs are much the same. The lows are much the same. Swing chart is in is an upswing, but you're just looking for a, sorry, there was a, that up hasn't resolved yet. So we haven't had lower, there were that, that big bar over there does confuse the swing chart. 
but underperforming equities. So S&P 500 rising by more than gold. You're seeing silver underperform gold now as well. Silver never made the all-time high that gold did. So you, you know, in a raging commodities market, you would have silver starting to outperform gold. That hasn't happened. Copper's made a new all-time high, fallen back into the range. That's weakness. And the weakness in, in Brent crude oil as well, although a bit of a jump up there, but it's in a longer-term downtrend. Bitcoin has given a sell signal on this kind of a short-term signal that we use here on, the, on this trending indicator, the Siroc. And uh, that's its all-time high, falling back into the range. The Ethereum never got to its all-time high. So relative weakness there compared to Bitcoin, but it's also given a sell signal as well. And uranium is basically going sideways. It's been going sideways to down since January. So a bit of a, a breath catcher over there. It was getting to the top of the channel, but some weakness there as well. Uh, there's also a weakness in iron ore. It's struggling to, it's fallen back into the range, jumped out of the range. But it really is starting to form, a, a, if you like, a base kind of price. And, and this has been going on now for about five years, four and a half years of this around about the 100 to 120 to $100 to $120 is kind of the range that it's hanging in. So if, you know, if it falls if it falls below, what is this price over here? $95, you know, th that, that would be weakness and would probably cause some problems for you know, the economies of the world, Australia being one of them. But if it you know, gets above $130 and starts takes out that previous peak over there, then that would flow through to the iron ore stocks. Thermal coal also forming a base at, at around about this $100 to $150. Well, it's not quite, it's about $120 to $150. And going back in history, you know, the, that is a pretty high base price you know, for, a, for an anti-coal world. But it's, and, you know, it might, as, as it becomes more scarce, well, that might play into higher prices. And so coal stocks are going to be around for a while. And we'll look for opportunities there. Right, that is to, you know, Don asked a question. I just looked at the questions. Should the technical analyses on the NASDAQ charts be moved to semi-log charts? Also, that is asking that question. Great question, Don. And certainly one that just given the, the movement is, what have we got here? 13,000 to 19,000 on the NASDAQ. So let's go here. So there we've got to the bottom of the of the uh, sorry where we're we going we've gone too far out the where's the tech crash uh, sorry the COVID crash was back here it was around about seven thousand so that's certainly any analysis going back there should definitely be on log and if we go back to this point over here that's about eleven to nineteen that's getting there but this analysis over here would be would be valid so that that channel line I'm happy with given that we are fourteen to nineteen thousand. So that, that's fine, but longer term analysis, going back to the, the COVID crash over here, certainly any analysis trend lines that, you, that you're using there, that should definitely be logged. And I suspect the same would be with, with the NASDAQ composite. If we go back to COVID, which is there, that's uh, 6,500, that would definitely, so this here, so with the, the channel lines I have here, this should definitely be moved to log. Take note of that and we'll thank you for that. And I will move to log charts for the NASDAQ Composite and the and NASDAQ 100 next time around. But we'll just finish on the S&P 500 because it is the standout index that is, is really raging along. And so from that perspective, it's, it's favoring bullish. There's no doubt about it. And we should be looking for upside out of this confusion and indecision that's happening in the markets at the moment. But it's not settled yet because anything can happen and you don't need to know what's going to happen next to make money in the market. There are no more questions. I'll finish there. I'll keep you updated. The next one may not be two weeks time, but it may. I've got some travel on at the moment, but wherever I am, if I can find a way to bring you it in two weeks time, then I will. If not, it's probably going to be closer to three weeks time that we have another one of these sessions. Until then, I wish you consistent and objective and peaceful trading.